last topic. And we'll get a fair way through this last topic today, I think, malicious software. We'll just introduce some concepts of malicious software. So the last topic is about what malicious users can u use or the approaches they can use to try to get access to our computer systems. First using uh, different pieces of software and then we'll look about how they can try and annoy us by performing denial of service attacks. That is, stop our computer system from working normally, stop our network from no working normally by performing some denial of service attack. And we'll just look at some basic concepts in this topic and a few simple examples. We'll not go into any depth. First, we want to talk about and define or classify different types of malicious software. I'm sure you've heard of a lot of the terminology before, some of that you know about, some of that you've heard of the terminology and may not be clear what it's about. We'll go through some different terminology and then go through the basics of a virus and a worm and a few examples and then finish with denial of service attacks. Note that this topic from the textbook is not in the, the hard copy but is online. There's a PDF document for this chapter. Um, if you cannot find it, then let me know if you want it so that the PDF is available for this topic. So it has some more examples that we won't get time to go through. So let's try and classify malicious software, software that does harm to our computer system. We can classify based upon whether the software, that malicious software, is dependent on a host or not. A host dependent malicious software means the software, the code or the, pro the programs, are embedded in actual programs normal programs and they are dependent upon those normal programs. They are dependent on a host. When I say host here we don't mean a computer host, we mean uh, a host of, in this case, a, another piece of software. So a virus is host dependent in that what a virus does, the malicious piece of code attaches itself to a non-malicious piece of code, a normal program. and it needs to be attached to that normal program to be of any use and the way it's distributed is by attaching to other uh, pieces of software. Host independent, it's an independent program. It doesn't attach itself to another piece of software, it's independent. It runs on its own. So one initial way to classify different malicious software. A worm we'll see is just a, a program that can do malicious things. It doesn't depend upon other programs for distribution and for execution. It, uh, it can propagate itself through a network um, and it can do malicious things on its own. We'll go through these different uh, types of malicious software shortly. Another way we can classify is whether it replicates or not. A non-replicating -repli malicious software runs and it runs on one, one computer normally and does not make copies of itself to distribute to other computers. Whereas a replicating malicious software makes copies of itself so it can be distributed to other computers and do harm on other computers as well. Both a virus and a worm replicate. They make copies of itself effectively. Let's look at some of those terms that you've I'm sure seen many times and give a very simple definition of what we mean by them. In some cases that they, uh, in our simple definitions that you can find, they're not precise in that you may find a piece of software that is both or is multiple uh, of these terms or it's hard to distinguish. What do we mean by virus? A malicious piece of software that attaches itself to another piece of software, another program, and propagates copies of itself to other programs. So you have the Microsoft Word 
executable, word.exe on your computer. That's a normal piece of software. If a virus attaches itself to that file, the executable file, then also propagates itself to other executable files, that is, copies itself to xl.exe, powerpoint.exe, and so on, then that's an example of a virus. A worm is an independent program. It doesn't attach itself to another piece of software. It's just its own executable program or own program. And it also propagates copies of itself to other computers. So a worm may be a program running on my laptop. And what it may do is when my laptop's connected to the internet, it may try and find other hosts on the internet, other computers on the internet, create a connection to them, a TCP connection, and copy it itself, the program, to those other computers on the internet and execute on those other computers. And as it executes, it does the malicious things. And it propagates by copying itself to other computers. But it's not attached to another program. Yep. Uh, no, they are, uh, they are separate. That is, a virus attaches... A virus is a piece of code that attaches itself to another program. That piece of code does something malicious, or can do something malicious. A worm is an independent program. So it's a piece of code that, that can be executed on its own. Um, so that's the main difference there, that one attaches to an existing program that is a normally used program that you and I may use, whereas a worm <coughs> is a program that does something malicious. Why would we run or execute a worm if we were tricked into thinking it's a normal program or if some other program exited, executed it for us? Think of a worm as a separate file. A uh, virus is some code that attaches to another file. Yep. What about zombies? Zombies? Zombies are somewhere later. We'll cover zombies, but not in much depth. Um, when we look at denial of service attacks, we'll talk about zombies uh, in terms of hosts which are uh, used to perform denial of service attacks on other hosts. But not necessarily... Uh, any relationship to a virus or a worm, a zombie. There's another, a zombie program. Uh, so the next slide, a zombie program activated on an infected machine. So we need to infect it. There's some of that previous steps. And it launches attacks on other machines. So we'll see when we look at denial of service to perform a denial of service on other computers there may be a zombie program on some computers that participate in that denial of service attack. We won't go through all of these. Uh, Logic Bomb is some malicious software that when some condition occurs, it takes some action. So maybe there's a Logic Bomb installed on my computer, just a piece of software, when the date reaches the 1st of April at 12 noon, that logic bomb performs some action, like deletes all the files on my hard drive. That's an, a simple example of a, a logic bomb. Takes some action when some conditions occur. A Trojan horse is some program that contains unexpected extra functions or functionality. Um, a program that we may normally use, we think it's a program for editing files, but it has some other code in it to do something malicious as well. So someone has created this program. Let's say it's a program to display images. So you download a, file, a program, an executable, that allows you to display images on your computer. You think all that it does is displays images. But if that program also has some malicious code to also uh, read the file names of images and send information back to some other computer about the images that you display, then that could be considered a Trojan horse, that program. 
from the normal user's perspective, it has functionality that they did not expect to include. And usually that functionality is malicious. <coughs> a backdoor or a trapdoor is some modification to a program that allows unauthorized access to functionality. You've, in labs, you've developed a client and a server where what does a, the server receives a request and on some port number and then the server sends back a response. A trapdoor or a backdoor is if you add some extra code in the server such that when the server receives a request of a special type, normally in your web server you send a request The client sends a request like get some file name and some protocol identifier. So your server handles requests. It receives requests. And if the request is of this structure, then the server reads this file and sends back the file as a response. What if you programmed, you could program your server such that if it receives a request of a particular format, do something extra, provide some additional functionality. For example, if you receive a request which is get slash index.html instead of the, the protocol version, some special code or some string when the server receives that request, it sees, okay, this request has this special string. It's programmed whenever the request has this special string to do something. For example, the server may create a copy of itself, a child, which now opens and listens on another port, port 81, and sends back data to some special computer. Does something malicious. The idea of the trapdoor is that some code in a program that is added to provide some extra functionality that normally is not expected in that program. So the code that allows me to receive this request and then do something malicious is the trapdoor in this code. It allows unauthorized access to functionality. Normally the server, we shouldn't be able to do this, create another server and send data out. The server should just receive a request and send a response. If I add code to allow that extra functionality, then that would be considered a trapdoor. Exploits, downloaders, you can read through some of them. Uh, flutters we'll talk about later, zombie programs, key loggers, you know, I think you understand something that captures the keys that you type in, sends those keys to another computer. Or, uh, pieces of software that generate viruses, so instead of you, a malicious person, having to write a virus, they use a piece of software that writes it for them, generates a virus. So just some of the terminology that you may come across listed here. We're going to go through just two of them in some depth, actually three. Virus, worm, and then the programs related to f denial of service attacks, flutters and zombie programs. What about a virus? The very basics of a virus. piece of software that infects other programs. So when it <coughs> infects other programs, if we can visualize that, on your computer system you have some executable files. <coughs> so here's a file, word.exe. So that's a normal program that you have on your computer. A virus attaches itself to that program. 
That is, this executable, when we load the file in memory, it performs some functions. If the virus is attached to that executable, that is, the file is still called word.exe, but the contents of that file contains the program instructions to execute Word plus the program instructions to execute the virus. So now when we load this file, word.exe, into memory, it executes the instructions for the virus and then the instructions for Word. From the user's perspective, they will not see or they may not see what happens when the virus is executed. It just looks like Word is being executed. That is, Microsoft Word opens up and you can create documents. But in fact, the virus code is executed as well. And we'll see some simple examples of the virus code. So the virus attaches itself to another program. The virus is normally a program or some code in itself to perform some malicious activity. The virus goes through different phases. It may be initially dormant, it does nothing, it's sitting idle, and it may be activated, moved to the next phase by some event. So it may be combined with a logic bomb. A simple logic bomb, as we said, some time e event when the virus may have some code that when the time and date equals this value or is greater than this value, then perform some actions. And the actions or the thing that it does, it may propagate itself. The virus is currently attached to word.exe. There are other executables on your file system. The propagation is attaching the virus to those other executables. So somehow it copies the instructions from the virus to other executables. <coughs> it propagates. So now when you open Excel, if the virus is attached, then the program instructions in the virus are executed and then the instructions as part of the original Excel.exe are executed, that is Excel opens up and the virus does its malicious activities, which may include propagating to other files. Again, the virus may be triggered to perform some malicious function by different events, again like a logic bomb, or after the virus has propagated to 10 different files, then do something malicious. What does it do? Well, whatever you can think of. It may be harmless. When the virus executes, it may simply display a message, you've been infected by this virus. Or it could be uh, harmful. It may delete all the files on your operating system, or a subset, or modify files, and so on. And anything in between. That is, uh, it can, anything you can program it to do may be executed by the virus. So that's the very basics of the virus. It needs to be attached to a program. It may propagate itself to other programs. And when it's triggered by some event or condition, it, may, it will execute and do its malicious things. Because the virus attaches itself to other executables normally, they're usually specific to different... To <coughs> Viruses are specific to operating systems and hardware platforms. That is, this virus must be able to be executed on an uh, Intel-based architecture, maybe even on a Microsoft Windows-based oper operating system. That is, it cannot be some code that cannot be executed on the system that executes the programs. If the virus was attached to XL.exe, in my Windows operating system, and somehow that whole file, the XL.exe, and the virus was copied to my Linux operating system, it's not going to execute, because I cannot execute the Windows EXE file 
on my Linux operating system, and therefore I cannot execute the virus. So usually the virus code is specific to an operating system or a hardware platform. It doesn't have to be, but usually it's simpler to, to create specific to a particular platform. So yes, the virus normally will be able to copy, but attached to another program. A, a worm, if I drew a worm, there's my worm. It doesn't attach to another program. Uh, so worm may perform the similar things, as a, perform similar functions as a virus, but the dis distinguishing feature is the worm is a standalone program. It doesn't attach to another program. So yes, a worm may propagate itself. To, so this may be file one. This may be another file. It may propagate itself, make copies of itself, but it's not attaching to other programs. Yep. Uh, in our Trojan horse contains unexpected additional functionality. That is, uh, a virus attaches to another program. A Trojan horse may be someone has developed XL.exe, okay? And it includes some functionality that's not about a spreadsheet. It's a functionality to record everything you type on your computer. Yeah, a virus attaches itself to an existing program. Which one's better? A uh, damage. Uh, I don't think there's any. No, no one is better than the other. Uh, the, they can do the same thing in theory. It's different in terms of how they're distributed. Because uh, a virus is distributed attached to another program, a worm needs to distribute itself as an individual program. So, uh, but they can both do, do malicious, the same malicious activities. Detection is another thing. Detection. Uh, which one's easier to detect? A virus is probably more common than a worm. Uh, a worm, you need to e get someone to execute that. Why would I execute file1.exe? <coughs> okay, I, I need to be tricked into executing file1.exe. But I always, every day, open word.exe. So if you can attach a virus to word.exe, then it's more likely that a user is going to execute that virus. Maybe that's a, a one difference. But in terms of what they can do, in theory, they can both do the same malicious things. Here's a simple virus, or, or the pseudocode of a simple virus. explaining the steps <coughs> where we have some program, the, the virus program. So th this is what I draw here. This is the code in here. All right, this shows the algorithm, but if we compile that, we get some executable instructions. That's what's stored here. In this simple case, We have a main and some subroutines. Uh, all right, at the start, when we, the first thing we execute, we go to the main. That is, we execute the main code here, the main program. And we have three different subroutines or functions. Infect, executable, do damage, trigger pulled. So when this virus code is executed, if we go to the we go to main, 
main program, infect the executable, then if the trigger is pulled, do some damage. Then go to next, which is the end of the virus, which is the start of the normal program. So you can think of after next, or from next onwards, is the normal code for word.exe. So the idea is, when you open word.exe, if the virus is attached, the virus will infect other executables. If some trigger has been pulled, that is if some conditions have been met, it would do some damage, whatever it's programmed to do, and then it will go and execute the instructions for word.exe, which means load up Word, display the window on your screen and allow you to edit documents with the idea that the user may not notice that the virus has been executed because Word opens up normally and the user doesn't know that the virus is, is there. So that's the, the structure. We'll go through these subroutines. A virus can... A virus could execute... Yep, a virus as the part of do damage. As part of do damage, the virus could potentially execute another file, including a worm. Yep. These, these are functions, subroutines. Function one, two, three. We call them here. So if you think about, for example, C, here's your main program. It calls three different functions. These are defined here. What are they? The main the first function or subroutine is infect executable. What does it do? Infect executable in a loop, so say in a while loop, get some random executable file. Let's try it on our examples. Let's say these two files are not infected at the moment. Our word file is infected. So somehow the word.exe file, the normal file, has been infected with this virus. It's, the file is still, still called word.exe. Someone has opened Word, that is, I've double-clicked on the Word icon, which executes this code, which means it executes the virus. Start of the virus, go to main, main program, infect executable. So we go to this subroutine, infect executable, in a loop, Get some random executable file on your hard drive. That is, find another file, another .exe file on the hard drive. Okay, it finds xl.exe, another file. If the first line of the file is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then go and find a different file. Why? Because the first line of our code, if it has this special string, it means it's infected with a virus already. That's the idea here. In other words, if the file that you just found is already infected, go back to loop and find another random file. If it's already infected, go find another one. We don't need to infect the same file again. So we find xl.exe. It doesn't have the virus. The first line is not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It doesn't contain the virus. Therefore, we get the else condition, prepend the virus, that is this code, to the file. The virus was executed in Word. It found another executable. It found that it's not currently infected because it doesn't have this special string at the start. Therefore, we attach the virus. Virus B. That's our propagation step. That's the subroutine infect executable. All right? It's just showing the steps. How to find another random file depends upon the system you're operating in. And of course, it doesn't have to be this string. The idea is that it's something that identifies that this file is already infected. So we finish the subroutine infect executable back in the main program if trigger pulled trigger pulled is a subroutine it returns true if some conditions hold what conditions whatever you program it to be for example if the date is greater than the 1st of April 
2012, then true. It returns true. Or if some count of files have been, ex have been infected, that is, every time we infect a file, we increase a counter. If that counter is above five, if we've infected five files, then return true. So some condition that you, the malicious user wants to trigger the malicious action to take place. So if it returns true, that is, if some condition holds, then do some damage, whatever damage is to be done. That is, whatever you want the virus to do. Delete files, show messages on the screen, modify Word documents, whatever. Whatever it can be programmed to do. And then finish. Go to next. Next. Which means go and execute the real code for Word.exe. Word opens up, the user didn't know. And of course, now we have another file if infected. Of course, we can infect multiple files. We can add counters in here to infect three files at a time and so on. So the very simple steps of a virus. Any questions so far? Implementing that depends upon the, again, the operating system, the hardware architecture, the programs you're infecting. Uh, so you, this is just the, the basic steps that, you, that the virus would do. How do we detect this virus? We, we can use a hash. Even simpler, we could look at the file size. If I know word.exe normally is uh, one megabyte, the original word.exe is one megabyte, and if I know that in advance, when the virus attaches itself, it adds another, say, 10 kilobytes. So the resulting word.exe file is 1.01 megabytes. In the simplest case, the file is larger than it should be. Why? Well, it shouldn't be. The word.exe file should not change in size. So a very simple virus detection software, if it knew in advance <coughs> the size of word.exe was one megabyte, if it ever changes, then that's a potential virus being detected. Because it shouldn't change. The executable shouldn't change unless you update Word software. More advanced than that, then you can start to, instead of recording the size of the file, record a hash of the file. Take a, take a hash of this file content. It produces some unique value, and your virus detection software knows that unique value. The hash of this file. is known by the virus detection software. If the virus is attached, so the file stored on the system, if you take a hash of it, it will be different. <coughs> the hash of the infected word.exe file will be different from the hash of your uninfected file. Therefore, if the virus detection software knows the hash of the uninfected file, it simply calculates the hash of the current file. If they don't match, there's a problem or a potential virus detected. And there are more advanced ways to detect as well, based upon the looking at the code, for example, seeing if the code in here matches some patterns of what a virus would do. The, again, the online chapter for this textbook, uh, from the textbook, has a little bit more description of some approaches for detection of, of viruses. We will not go through them. A compression virus simply <coughs> overcomes this problem of detecting based upon the size. If our virus detector checks the size of the file 
against the known size of the uninfected file, in this case it will easily be detected. The resulting file is 1.01 megabytes. The real file should be just one, virus detected. A compression virus can defeat that by compressing itself. such that we have the original file by not compressing itself, compressing the, the file. Normally when we attach the virus, it makes the file larger. Then when we attach the virus, which is 10 kilobytes, compress this. make it smaller, such that the total size is one megabyte. That's the idea of a compression virus. Take the original file plus the virus, compress the original file such that the size plus the virus is the same as the original file size. When the virus executes, it does it the same as before, but before it loads the word.exe, it decompresses it. Un it's uncompressed and then executes. So that's just the, the basics of a compression virus. Uh, what are the steps shown here? We have a compressed or a compression virus attached to some program. When we execute the compression virus, we have to decompress the program, the VP1, execute that, and then compress it again to get the original file back, uh, the original smaller file back. For each uninfected file, each other program, like XL.exe or PowerPoint.exe, the virus compresses that program here it compresses P2 pr to produce, this should be P2 prime in the lecture notes. 0.1 to produce P2 prime, where P2 prime is the compressed P2. The virus is prepended to P2 prime, so the resulting size is the same as P2. That is this plus this is the same size as P2. But the basic concept, compress so that our resulting file is the same as the original file. But still doesn't solve or prevent detection against the hash-based detection. Still the hash of this compressed virus and compressed file will be different than the hash of the original word file. Even though they're the same size, they have different bytes in them. Therefore, they'll get a different hash value. But how do you know the hash value of a file in advance? You, your virus detection needs to know in advance that the hash value of word.exe is some particular value. Sorry? That's hard, yes. I mean, for some common programs, it's easy to know. You, the software provider can let the virus detection provider know. But what about I developed my own program? It's on my computer. The hash is some value. How does my virus detection software know that that hash value is the hash of the uninfected file and not the hash of the infected file? That's not easy. Yes, so even, even compressing doesn't help against the hash detection. You're right. That is, even with a compressed virus, the hash values will be different. If we knew the original hash value, we could detect that virus. Uh, no need to go through this. This is the same as before, except it includes some steps to compress the file that we infect and uncompress the file that we've infected.
So that's the very basics of a virus. We'll see uh, some real code a little bit later. Um, What types of viruses do we have? Some classification. What we've talked about is a parasitic virus, a virus that attaches itself to other executables. That's what we've just gone through in our example. The virus attaches to other executables and propagates by attaching to, to different executable files. Other types of virus, so that attaches to different files, executable files. A memory resident virus is stored in main memory and as a program is run, that is loaded into memory, then it attaches. So this virus is stored on disk. It is, it's a file on disk, this virus is stored on disk attached to some file, original file. A memory resident virus is stored in memory, say in RAM. It's loaded in RAM. When you load an uninfected file, that is you open PowerPoint.exe into memory, it loaded into memory, then because the virus is also in memory, it can attach and infect that file. So as other programs are executed, that virus infects them. So it's a different as to when it infects. Memory resident virus, whenever a program is run, it can be infected. A parasitic virus, whenever that virus is run, it can infect other files, not necessarily in memory, just other files on the hard disk. Similar in the boot sector, rather than in main memory, computers have some memory for when they boot up. If the virus is stored there, Whenever your computer boots up, it can infect different software. Not so popular to, uh, now, but for example, when you could boot from a, a floppy disk in the past, if the floppy disk had a virus, when, when you boot from a flo floppy disk, you put the floppy disk in, turn the computer on, the computer reads the floppy disk to boot the computer. But if that floppy disk has a virus, when you boot the computer, everything in your computer is now potentially compromised. The, the virus can be loaded. Uh, the same can be applied to the, if you boot from a flash drive. Yep. So anything that is loaded into memory after you boot can potentially be infected by that virus. Uh, a virus normally will attach something to something that can be executed. All right? and an exe file is normally executed. What about an image file? Is an image file executed? Uh, like a computer can add uh, some arbitrary code to an if the program that doesn't write well when it reads the file, it can execute yeah. this arbitrary code. Yeah, although you don't execute an image file, some other program opens that image file. So if that other program, like you said, is not implemented well, if it opens that image file and it contains a virus, then if that causes the program that opens the file to do something bad, then that can be a problem. The image could contain the virus. And uh, maybe a better example is a PDF file. Normally a PDF is a document. <coughs> it's not something we execute. But if your Acrobat reader perform some actions based upon the contents of that file and there's a problem with how a re a Adobe Reader does that, then potentially if the PDF contains some virus code, when you open the PDF in the reader, then that virus code may be executed by the reader. Yes, so the virus could be attached to the file, the PDF, but that depends upon some other program from on executing the virus when it opens that file. Yep. 
uh, no, uh, in say in Windows you have the what the System32 directory which contains mainly operating system files. Again, they're just files. If they are infected and they're executed by the operating system, the same as infecting Word.exe. So, yes, any file is part of the operating system. Your the file that uh, you know runs the kernel whatever features of the operating system, the graphical window manager and so on, they can be infected the same as word.exe can be infected. But it would generally be easier to infect a program that is not protected, that does not need uh, administrator access to modify. But any file on the system that can be executed, a virus could potentially attach to. Any file that is not executed can have a, a virus attached, but it will only be effective if another program opens and executes the virus, like uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader, which opens PDFs. Boot sector is the part of memory that when your boot computer boots up before it loads the operating system, it must enable the keyboard and so on, and then load the operating system. It's if it, the virus is in there. Two different classifications. Uh, in fact, so we have a, a normal parasitic virus that just copies itself to other other files. A polymorphic virus copies itself to other files and changes itself. Changes not the functionality, but its looks, its appearance. The virus is some code, as we saw. Uh, let's go back to our example virus. Our simple virus was some code where the first line contains this special string, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So every file infected by this virus should contain this string at the start. A normal virus simply copies the virus to another file. It was copied from Word to Excel. A polymorphic virus copies itself but changes the code. For example, changes the string to something else. some other special string. Why? Because without making changes, it's very easy once you can detect the virus based upon the code to find it. Let's say our virus detection software knows that this virus starts with the string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Simple to detect the virus. Just look for all files on your system that start with that string and you'll detect that. The idea of a polymorphic virus is if you change that string, then if the virus detection software only knows about the string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it will detect this virus, but it will not detect this one because even though it does the same thing, it was copied from here, it doesn't start with this special string. So a polymorphic virus changes or mutates it with each copy, but it only changes its appearance. It doesn't change its functionality or behavior. How do you do that? You can add extra code that does nothing. Extra redundant code, reorder code. Sometimes you have two lines of code. Doesn't matter what order they're in, you still get the same behavior. But now the code is different if you change the order. So the, the appearance is different, making it potentially harder for virus detection but the functionality is still the same. So it's not too hard to change the code such that you get the same behavior. It makes it harder to detect compared to a normal parasitic virus. The next step up is a metamorphic virus. Change the code, change the appearance, as well as the behavior. Change the virus when you copy to another file so it does something different. 
So when this virus is executed, it infects PowerPoint.exe. The code in here does something different from this virus. Maybe this one on the 1st of April deletes some specific file. This one on, uh, after it infects five other files, it um, removes some file, but does different actions than the original virus. So it changes its behavior. That's much harder to detect, because not only is the, the very simple things have been changed, like strings, reordering of code, but the functions have been changed. So harder to detect, but harder to implement. How do you change the code? Well, this virus must be programmed to change itself. That is, the code here must be programmed to change the, its own code to get something that works when it copies itself. That's not easy to implement. So in terms of ability to detect, parasitic virus is easier to detect than a polymorphic virus, which is easier than a metamorphic virus. But in terms of ability to implement, it's easier to implement a parasitic virus than a polymorphic virus, which is easier than a metamorphic virus. So uh, by making changes, it's harder to detect, but it's harder to implement. Yeah, a metamorphic virus changes its own code. It needs to be programmed to change its code. That's what, so the, there needs to be code in the metamorphic virus that says move this line to somewhere else or do something else. So it needs to be programmed to change its own code, which is, again, hard to implement to do something uh, uh, that, that's of value and also to be without detected. Yes, so then your virus detection needs to look for functionality that changes the code and try to detect that is uh, part of a virus. Did I include any viruses in your handouts? Why not? In the past, I did, but I'll show them later. Uh, quickly, we've mentioned that a virus and a worm are very similar, except a worm is a standalone program, a virus attaches to another program. So, a worm is software that replicates itself and sends copies to other computers normally. So, it's normally not so much about distributing inside one computer, but replicating to other computers. And of course it may perform some malicious functions as well. Same with a virus, it propagates itself and performs some malicious functions. But it's a standalone program. You would have heard about, and some of you may have even received, email viruses. A, an email with some code included that is a virus, or you hear it as an email virus. An email, is it a virus or a worm? Well, sometimes it's hard to distinguish what's a virus or a worm. It, if it's an email, it's not an executable program like a virus. It's just some text message, an email. But if it has an attached some file, then normally we can consider it a virus. One difference is normally worms propagate by themselves without user intervention. An email virus normally requires the user to read the email, uh, that is, they read it, which causes the execution of what's attached to that email, and then it's propagated. So the email type virus, email type malicious software is often considered a virus as opposed to a worm. A worm propagates by itself. How? How does it propagate by itself? Usually using network software. 
using software that normally creates connections to other computers. Email software, for example. Your email client or a, a server running on different computers, they create connections between different computers, and you can send data via those connections. Or things like Secure Shell for remote execution. Telnet Secure Shell creates a connection from one computer to another. If our worm is running on my computer, and as part of the code of the worm, it creates a secure shell connection to some other computer, then it can send itself, a copy of itself, to that other computer. And now that worm has propagated onto that other computer. So use network software to propagate the worm through to other computers. Remote login, and so on. Sockets. Uh, What does a worm do? It needs to search for other systems to infect, connect to one or a selection of those other systems, to those other remote computers, and then copy, it, copy itself to the remote system and cause that copy to execute. It's no, usually not much benefit if you copy the worm to another system and the other system doesn't execute the worm. It just sits there as a file. We need somehow for that worm to execute. So normally worms are executed without user intervention. some computers on the internet. And initially there's a worm installed on this computer. And it's executed, say by a malicious user. What it needs to do is search for other systems to, to infect. Maybe it's distributing itself via HTTP. That is, it looks for other web servers. So maybe randomly try some different web servers. Create connections to other web servers. So it connects to those other web servers and copies itself. How would you copy a, web, a worm to a web server? Well, what do we normally send to a web server? A GET request. But there are other types of requests. If we can attach the code for that worm in this request that goes to the web server, and then get the web server to execute that code, then we can distribute that worm to other web servers. And in fact, that's what, uh, what was it called? The code red worm did. It ma took advantage of bugs in some web servers such that you could send some special request to the web server which includes some code attached to it. The bug in the web server meant that when the web server received that request, it stored what was attached and executed that. So executed something in a request, which is a, what a web server should not do. It should not execute something in a request should send back a response. So if there's a bug in the server, the code red worm was an example of the web server would execute that and then do something malicious. So a worm distributes to other computers. If we can get it on other computers, then it does the same. It connects to other computers and distributes to other uh, further until it's infected many computers. And of course, once those computers are infected, it can do malicious things. Do we have an example? Of course, you can look at this exponential growth of infecting computers. If every worm infects four new computers every hour, so we start with one worm, it infects four computers in one hour, 
How long does it take to infect the world? Six billion, seven billion. It's a matter of hours. Try that. You infect the first four, they infect another four, and another four, so there's 16, another four, 64, 64 times four. Nine. You think the answer is less than 24 hours? So by this exponential growth, it doesn't take long to infect many computers, a number of hours in that case. That's at a slow infection rate of one every hour, 16 hours to infect the world. So if, now that's under the assumption that the worm can find other systems to infect. In practice, it normally relies on the other systems having some bug, some problem in their code such that they'll accept that worm and execute it. My web server should not receive code and execute that code. It's a poorly programmed web server if it does that. But if there's some bug in it, such that it does receive some code and executes it, then it's potential to distribute the worm in that way. So in practice, it normally requires on taking advantage of bugs in software. And in fact, all of these, or most of the malicious software takes advantage of that. So then it's a matter of not finding any web server, it's finding a web server running this specific version of software that has the bug. If someone, has if someone has updated the software such that the bug has been removed, then they cannot infect that. So it usually relies on the fact that software is not updated often enough to remove some bug. Examples. Let's show you some examples on the screen first. These are some old uh, examples of real malicious software. It's just a text file. We'll zoom in to make it a bit easier to see. We'll zoom in a bit more. This is the Melissa virus and this, the source code. So this was a real virus which was distributed. Um, and did significant damage in terms of it was distributed to many computers. And uh, not only does it, is the damage from, uh, for example, doing malicious things like deleting files, but damage can be in terms of downtime. If a virus is distributed to many computers, A, it uses up network resources when it's distributed, and B, when you need to remove the virus from files, it uses up human resources. Someone has to remove the virus. Usually that means in downtime of computer systems. So that contributes to the cost of a virus. This was a, a word macro. You know, in Microsoft Word, you can add macros, visual basic macros, to do some functionality. A Word document is not executable, but a macro attached to it, included in it, is executable. So this is an example of a macro. We're not 
you don't need to understand Visual Basic, but we'll see some basics, some basic, some simple uh, steps that were used in this virus. Uh, so it's executed when a document is opened. Uh, let's see. So without explaining, one thing that it does here is usually Word has this feature to disable the security or, or enable or disable the security. That is, do you want to automatic, ex automatically execute macros? When you open a document, should the macros be executed? If you enable security, then they will not be executed when you open the document. If this was, if a document containing this source code was opened and the security was off, then the macro would be executed and it turns off the security controls. It makes sure they will stay off. That is, it sets the security to be disabled. The enabled being false, so that in any future instances it will not detect the virus or it will allow the virus to be detected, uh, to be executed. So just one thing, turn off security so that this code will be executed in the future. I think that's about um, the access control on particular files. Uh, if you don't have permissions to execute a file, then you don't have permissions. I don't understand random characters either. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, that could be related to the operating system, for example. The operating system may create temporary files or automatically create files such that the file names do not match existing ones. I don't understand Windows either. <laughs> I, I use it when I'm forced to, yeah. <laughs> Let's look at this virus. So this is a macro attached to, say, a Word document. You open up the Word document, the macro is executed. It turns off the security features in Word so that, or in Office. Uh, it sets some strings so it, it knows that I think that this version of Office has been uh, infected by this virus. So Melissa virus has some, you recognize this is a, a registry entry in the, for the operating system, some operating system level um, parameter value. What does it do? This makes use of Outlook, you know, the email client, the Windows email client, Outlook. And what it does is uses Outlook to send the virus attached to emails. So it tries to find Outlook, makes checks if Outlook is available, and tries to find the list of addresses in your address book. So if you have Outlook running on your computer, and you have many people in your address book, it tries to access that address book and gets email addresses from your address book and I think up to 50 email addresses. So it goes, it loops up to 50 and then it sends an email. It creates an email with some subject, important message from, and it takes the username from your address book. So in your address book, if you had Stephen Gordon and the email address, this virus would find the name Stephen Gordon and the email address. It would say in the subject of the email, important message from Stephen Gordon. Since I'm in your email address, in the address book, then uh, sorry, it's not from the from person, from the user of this Outlook uh, from the computer. So if it's your computer infected, the username would be your name. Creates an email subject, a body. Here is that document you asked for. Don't show anyone else. It attaches the document that's infected with this virus, this macro. 
and it sends that. So it uses Outlook to send the email. So what it does, finds 50 addresses in your Outlook address book, sends 50 emails containing this one document, each containing the document with the virus attached as the macro, and you, or each of those 50 people receive an email saying, here's an important message from this person. You most likely know that person. You most, most likely recognize their name. And you get an email, here's that document you, asked, document you asked for, don't show anyone else. Many people open the document because it looks like a personal message. It's from someone they know because they're in their address book. So if the other person who receives the email opens the document, then the macro will be executed on that receiver's computer. So the macro virus has been propagated to some other computer uh, by email in this case. It's an email virus, yes. In fact, it's got characteristics of a virus and a worm. It's a virus in that it's attached to another file. Uh, but it's using network software to propagate in this case. So this might be yeah, we classify this as a virus. What else does it do? I think that's about it. What's down the bottom? It tries to attach, uh, from memory, it tries to load the virus to attach other files on that same computer by putting itself in the template. So that when you open a new document from the template, that template will contain the virus. And the last thing that it does, yeah, it saves a file with some message. And then there's a like a logic bomb. If the day, uh, if the current day equals the current minute, so today is the 27th. If the minute is minute 27, then this would be true. Then show this text on the screen, 22 points and so on. So show some harmless message on the screen. But there's an example of a logic bomb in that, or some condition that triggers something extra to happen. If the current day equals the current minute, then display this text. So that's an example of a real virus that was caused billions of dollars of damage across the world. Very simple. Another one. This is Visual Basic. Uh, that's the language used in uh, Office Macro. Uh, but 100 lines of code. So if you knew Visual Basic, not hard to do. Of course, this relied on users using Microsoft Outlook as their email client because it only uses Microsoft Outlook. And it relied on features of Outlook to automatically execute uh, to load or Outlook and Office to automatically execute the virus, the macro. I think nowadays that if this was sent, most likely Outlook and Office would block the execution. At least give you some warning that you should not execute this macro. Here's a different virus, I love you. What does it do? It's it's a Visual Basic script. So again, using Visual Basic. Uh, so the the file name, for example, in this love letter for you dot text dot VBS. So most likely what your uh, listing of files shows in Windows, if it hides the last extension, it may show as 
just love letter for you dot txt. So some people would miss that this is an actual uh, Visual Basic script uh, and think it's just a text file. It copies itself to different locations. We see three different locations here in the system directory, in the Windows directory, as different files. So some file .vbs, the Visual Basic script. Was it do? It tries to read the C drive. It looks if some file exists. Winfat32.exe, if it exists on your uh, file system in, a, in the system directory. It creates some registry entries. In Windows, you have a registry which stores parameters about applications in the operating system. It creates some registry entries, which are start pages for Internet Explorer. See, Internet Explorer start page, this website, HTTP, Skynet, .net, and this long link, which is a link to an executable. You see? And there are others as well. The idea is that now when, if this registry entry is added, now when you open Internet Explorer, your start page is this link. Internet Explorer goes to this link, which is an .exe file. If you download that file and execute it, then you've installed other malicious software. So it's a way for distributing this other executable malicious software onto your computer. By simply putting, changing the start page of your web browser. Why not? <laughs> Many people, it, it may be automatically downloaded or it says, pops up a warning saying, win bug, bugs fix, do you want to download? Yes. Some people will say no, some people will say yes. If they don't understand about why is this file coming to me, okay, it's my, it's my web browser producing a file. My web browser maybe is updating itself. So all of you will not download, but if some people do download because they don't really understand what's happening there, then that'll be infected. You get some file, you know, why would a, your web browser present this file? Some people would believe that it's because of something nice and they would download and execute. Yeah? Yeah, if, if this is, this will not work on Mac OS. There's no, it will not execute, uh, executable, and it, Mac OS doesn't have a registry like this. So it will not execute. So if, if this file is distributed to Mac OS, in fact, the, the, the original file probably will not execute. Even if it did, it would return many errors. So that's why we say most of the malicious software we talk about is developed, targeted for a specific operating system, a particular hardware architecture. But that's not always true. It's in theory possible to write that would work across different uh, systems. If you would somehow detect the system and have code for each system or have generic code that could be executed on any system, it could be distributed. And of course it relies in, on Internet Explorer. Uh, so it puts in some different URLs pointing to some website with the hope that a user would download this. And this file, this executable file in this case, actually was a, from memory, it was, a, it was like a keylogger. It recorded, uh, it recorded key presses. I'm not sure whether it's just key presses, but somehow tried to record passwords typed in. So once that executable was executed on your system, it would record what you do and send that back to some main server. So if you install this software, it records what you're doing, including your password, 
and sends that data back to a main server so that main server can then discover your password. That was the idea. And that's about it, I think, for that one. It just updates the start page. Uh, tries to copy itself to other files. Uh, so copy itself to other files, looking for different extensions to copy to. Anything else? This one again caused a lot of damage. And again, you see it's just 100, 128 lines of code. It's not very complex. The person who created this left some identifying information in, in the, uh, both in the virus and in the servers that it contacted. So those web pages that your browser automatically visits, the person hosting that or who created that traced back to the person who created the virus. So people could find the person who created this virus quite easily. He was caught within a matter of days. But still it caused a lot of damage because of the billions of computers or millions of com Windows computers, even if just 1% of the people click on yes, execute this file, it can still cause a lot of damage. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, what year? Uh, it's not in the. These are both of these are in the mid 1990s, I think. Uh, mid 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 to late 1990s. Uh, well, maybe it's late 1990s. Um, maybe even later. Where are we? Yeah, actually, uh, I don't know why I deleted it. I had a two slides on these. One was. Yeah, maybe it was mid 2000s. When, when, um, yeah, when, yeah, all right, Melissa's is using Word 2000. You would have heard of Melissa virus probably uh, when it was around. And this, this I Love You was around the same time. And they did billions of dollars of damage, at that, both of them in that case. Um, they would not work now because of most email clients would not, would have restrictions to prevent that being sent. And, and Office would not execute some of these things. But at that stage, they spread quite quickly. The Melissa virus, the I love you vir worm. Uh, Code Red was an example of a bug on the Microsoft web server such that you could send some specially formed request to get the web server to store some malicious code. And uh, from memory, what that did is every month it contacted a particular website and performed a denial of service on that website, on the White House website. So that was an example of a worm that did multiple things. It infected web servers which had some bug, and it used those web servers to do a denial of service attack on a particular web server in the internet. Uh, yeah, these are some names of examples. Yeah. And of course, there are many others. And these are old ones, because you can find the code quite easily, and they're reasonably safe. Then again, don't try and execute that code. <laughs> You could cause problems. The, the I Love You one was created by some student, and apparently he created it as part of his computer science degree, submitted it to his professor as part of a, some project report, and he got an F for it, saying the professor said, don't do this. But then he di did it, and he got caught uh, after doing a lot of damage. We're showing you so that you can understand, A, that it's very basic, uh, but to understand what you're up against in terms of protecting computer networks, comp protecting computer systems.
don't try and go and create a virus. I know you're not malicious, but even for learning purposes, for learning purposes, the problem if you go and create something and you accidentally get it to work, and then it's released, and it still can cause problems and cause legal problems for you and others. Uh, so you need to be very careful when you deal with that. Well, may, maybe after you get out of jail, it may, <laughs> after a few years, people may think it's good, but for the first few years, it may not be so good. Uh, virus software companies, the virus detection companies and so on, um, and researchers that deal with viruses <laughs> treat them like medical viruses in that they store them on disks or on hard drives that are stored in locked cabinets. You don't store them on a network in the case that someone may accidentally execute it and it gets released. So you need to take some cases physical security precautions to make sure a virus, a software virus, is not released. So you need to be careful. We have 10 minutes remaining. The last topic we're going to look at for this course, and I think we might as well start today because then we'll finish earlier tomorrow, denial of service attacks. And in particular, distributed denial of service attacks. This is one service that we haven't looked at. Uh, we've looked at all of our first five security services, confidentiality, data integrity, let's go confidentiality using encryption, data integrity, authentication using um, hashes, MAC, uh, signatures and so on. Uh, access control, when do we look at access control? Uh, not, or part, or, no, authent authentication is separate. Access control is letting limit use of files. So we haven't really looked at it in this course, but if you take in the lab, you use firewalls. A firewall is a, a way to control access to a network. So access control, non-repudiation is we use digital signatures. And the other service, availability, which is different from the first five. It's about making sure our computer, our computer system, our network is available for the normal use. A denial of service attack, DOS attack, aims to prevent real users, the normal users, from using the system. A simple denial of service attack comes from a single computer towards a single computer or network. A distributed denial of service attack comes from many computers towards one single network or computer. That's the main differences. A simple denial of service attack is usually easy to stop or it's hard to implement. But we'll see a distributed denial of service attack. If you have 1,000 computers on the internet trying to attack the ICT web server, then that's not so hard to perform. Attack by means of making the web server unavailable for the students to access the lecture notes during the, the exam period that is prevent the normal use, or attack the IT server such that you cannot do your online quiz because the uh, server is not available because it's overloaded from those 1,000 attacking computers sending messages to the server. Can be very hard to prevent a distributed denial of service attack, and sometimes hard to detect because a server offers, offers services to people on the internet, web server may. So how do we know it's an attack? And it's not just that my web server has become popular because everyone's trying to visit it. So we need to distinguish between malicious behavior and attack and normal behavior of many people accessing the server because it's become popular. A simple denial of service attack comes from a single computer. That's easy for the attacker. The attacker gets their own computer, 
gets it to send many packets. We'll see some examples how, but send many packets to the destination. It doesn't work very well because you can A, detect that there's one computer sending packets. You can start to block packets coming from that computer uh, and you can find that computer in some cases. In a distributed denial of service attack, there are many computers sending packets to that one server. So now it's harder to detect whether it's normal users. It's harder to prevent. So how do you block all of those computers from sending packets in? So for a distributed denial of service attack where we have many computers performing the attack, the attacker needs to control many computers. How does the attacker get control of 10,000 computers on the internet, assuming they don't own 10,000 computers? Then they usually use other malicious software to get access to other people's computers and use those infected hosts to perform an attack. We'll just go through one example. The TCP SYN flooding attack. Remember with TCP, the first thing you do is the client sends a SYN segment to the server. So if the client is the web browser, the server is a web server, you send a SYN segment to the server. If the server is going to accept the connection, it sends back a SYN act, and then the, the act, and then we send data. Whenever your server receives a SYN segment, it allocates some memory to set up this connection. It stores some memory or allocates memory to store the IP address and port numbers and some information for the sequence numbers for TCP. Every time someone sends a SYN packet to a server, the server allocates a little bit of memory for the upcoming connection. The idea of the SYN flooding attack is you get many clients to send SYN packets to the server with the intent of overflowing the server. We'll come back to that slide, but it's illustrated here. We have our target web server, the server that we want to attack. We have the attacker machine. That is, the malicious user has their computer. They need to get control of what's called slave servers, slave computers, other computers on the internet that can perform the attack on their behalf. So somehow, m maybe there's 10,000 computers here, 10,000 different slaves. The attacker needs to get some software on those 10,000 computers that will perform the attack for them. Maybe they've infected those 10,000 computers with a virus or a worm where that virus or worm performs this attack. What the attack is, is that these many slave computers send TCP SYN packets to the server. The server responds with a SYN act. That's what you do when you want to accept a connection, respond with a SYN act packet. Or potentially, if you don't want to accept a connection, you can respond with a, a reset or a close, a finish packet to close the connection. Importantly, the server allocates memory for every connection that's about to be set up. It allocates some memory on the computer. If we get enough slaves to send SYN packets in a short period of time to the server, we can overload the server. And a way to make this work is that the slaves send a TCP SYN with a fake or incorrect source address. What the target does, the one that receives this TCP SYN, is sends back a response, an act, a SYN act if it's accepted, a reset if it's not accepted. If we don't want to set up the connection, we send it back a reset but we send it to this fake or incorrect source address. So the slave server is not going to receive it. It's going to go to someone else or it's going to go to nowhere, a fake address. The target server stores in memory some data about the upcoming connection. For example, the addresses. 
for every accepted connection. And it waits for an act to come back because they send a sin to the server, the server sends back a sin act, and then it's expecting the final act. The server is expecting the final act. The server stores in memory data about the connection until it receives the final act. And if it doesn't receive the final act, after maybe one or two minutes, it may time out and delete the data. If the target server receives many SINs within a short period of time, so thousands over periods of seconds, then we can start to consume the memory on the server. A server has a limited amount of memory. If we can overload it with many SINs, then we can use up the memory. And therefore, if the memory is full, then a legitimate connection coming from a normal user will be rejected because the memory is full and they cannot accept any more connections. So the normal user tries to access the target server and that normal user cannot connect to the target server, therefore denying service for the normal user. So this one is an attack on the amount of memory at the server. It takes advantage of how TCP allocates memory for each connection that's potentially set up. Note that Sorry, wrong way. There's a, an attacker needs to take control of many slave servers or slave computers. If the attacker needs to own these computers, it gets very difficult because you need thousands of computers. It won't work with 10 computers because you, it's hard to overload the server. But with thousands of computers sending at a rate of many SIN packets per second, then we can overload the server. To get thousands of computers, normally the attacker needs to infect those computers with some other malicious software. So get a virus on there that performs the attack for their behalf. How do we prevent it? Firewall, but what do we drop? If we have a firewall just before the server here that drops SIN packets, well, normal users can't contact the server. So how do we prevent? Because, yeah. Yes, okay, the problem is that the server stores some memory for some period of time waiting for the final act. You could reduce that period of time, but again, that may impact upon normal applications if there's a large delay. Uh, so that has an impact potentially on normal users. So a firewall won't work. Uh, it's very hard to prevent such an attack because a normal user sends a SIN packet to the web server and it sends back a SIN act as does the malicious user. How do you differentiate between a malicious and a normal user? What if it was the web server just became popular? Many people link to it on Twitter and therefore many people within a short period of time go to that web server. How do we know it's just not normal people accessing the web server and malicious denial of service attacks? Set up another server, right? Set up another server but that requires more resources on your part. Yeah, again, that costs money, more resources. <laughs> then your service becomes not available to all your customers who pay money and they no longer pay money to you. Uh, <laughs> then, yeah. There are ways now in TCP, which is called what TCP SIN cookies, but basically requires some extra exchange uh, and the idea is to get some, in, put some extra uh, resource demand on the sending the request such that it's harder for them to um, 
A, like the first comment, you can drop data about the connection quicker. If they do not respond within a short period of time, remove it from memory. Uh, and SIN cookies involve exchanging some extra data for, with a real user. A real user will be able to exchange, will, is willing to exchange extra information in the TCP SIN setup. A malicious user will not. Um, so you can distinguish between a real user and a malicious user based on the uh, ability for the real user to do some extra processing at the client. Uh, possibly, I don't know. I don't know whether it's called the half connection. Uh, yeah, that may be slightly different. I don't know. Enough for now. We'll stop there. Do the quiz online. <laughs>